Good evening, church family. We appreciate you tuning in to North Greensburg Church of God service tonight. It is Wednesday night, uh, February 24th. Can you believe February is almost over and March will be here next week? Wow. Uh, the time just keeps flying by. Just looking there on Facebook a little while ago and saw a little young man that's going to be 18 months old next month. And it just seems like yesterday he was born. But uh, anyway... Nevertheless, time just keeps ticking right along. So we're thankful that you are tuned in tonight, and we want to open up in prayer. We do have a very special prayer request. Uh, one of our members, Sister Kathy Brooks, her cousin Ronnie up in Virginia, uh, we need to pray for him as well as for his wife. They are both sick, um, breathing issues, possibly COVID or, or past symptoms of COVID, uh, so uh, let's remember them in prayer uh, and also, of course, remember each other and um, pray for the service tonight as Brother Coble uh, continues to share with us from the book of Revelation uh, and then that, God, you'll just have your way. And that's what we'll pray for. Any other requests, Brother Coble? Um, let's continue to remember, um, continue to remember in prayer my dad. Let's Pray for Donnie Duncan, um, Mike and Linda Wilson, and speaking with her, her grandson got his cast off his hood. He's now wearing a boot, so okay. we're Good. grateful for that. Mm -hmm. um, let's pray, continue to pray for Gail Edwards. She needs a touch from the Lord. Mike Ingold's been battling gout over at Blumenthal's. Uh, just several needs that we know God's able to touch. And Brother Palmer was our one to pray for this week, right? Yes. Okay, so let's, let's take these uh, requests to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we do thank you, Lord, once again, God, for another day that you've blessed us to live. Lord, we thank you, God, for your hand of mercy, your hand of protection, God, watching over us, Lord, being with us, God, today. We thank you for that, Father. And Lord, we lift up these requests to you, Father God. We uh, pray, God, for Kathy's cousin Ronnie, Lord, and his wife, Chris, Father God. Lord, as they are battling the sickness, God, you know, Father God, what's going on. And we pray, God, that you would give doctors wisdom, Lord, to know how to treat them. And God, we also uh, lift up, Lord, my father-in-law, uh, Donnie Coble, to you, God, that you would just uh, touch him, God. And Lord, comfort his heart, God, this week, Lord, and Jenna and Bill as well, God, as, and my heart as well, Lord, as we are dealing with the loss of Bill's mom 10 years ago yesterday. And Lord, we're, we thank, we're thankful, God, that you are the God of comfort. And, Lord, you will comfort us, God, and give us strength. And, Lord, we thank you for that, Father. Lord, we lift up the Duncan's uh, family to you, God, Brother Donnie Duncan, uh, God, and Sherry and Danny, God, that you would touch each one of them, Father. And, Lord, be with them, God. And, Lord, we pray that you would just touch Donnie, God, and help him, Lord, in his breathing and uh, help him mentally, God, physically, God, that you would just touch him, Lord, in all areas, God, of his life, Father. And, Lord, we uh, pray, God, for continue prayer, God, for Rita Dixon, God, tonight, that you would touch her. Uh, God, that you would just continue, Lord, to touch her breathing, God, and allow her, Father, God, to uh, feel better real soon, God. We pray for Mike and Linda Wilson, God, that you would touch them, Lord. We're thankful, God, that... Uh, their grandson, Matthew, God, was able to uh, get the cast off and is now in a boot, God. And, Lord, we pray that you continue to touch that foot, God, that he had surgery on a few weeks ago. God, continue, Lord, just to touch him. And, Lord, we thank you, God, for all things, God. We lift up, God, uh, Brother Palmer, to you, God. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would touch him, Father, and, Lord, just continue to be with him. And, Lord, thank you, God, for, Lord, he's almost 90 years old, God, and I can't even imagine the things, God, that he's seen in this old world. Uh, but, God, I pray that you would touch him, and God, continue to touch him, Lord, as well as all of our uh, senior citizens, God. We uh, thank you, Lord, for them, God, and we pray that you would touch them. Uh, Lord, we also, God, pray for Mike Ingold, God, that you would touch him in the gout issue, God, that he's got going on, Father. We pray, God, that you would touch him. Uh, Lord, and heal his body, God, and, and his sister, Gail, God, that you would touch her and be with her, God, and, and continue, God, to encourage her spirits, Lord, and God, just touch our time together, God, tonight, Lord, we pray that you would bless in the singing, 
uh, God, and Lord, touch and anoint in that, Father, and then touch and anoint, Lord, our pastor. God, as he shares with us, Lord, from the word of God, uh, Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, God. Give us knowledge and wisdom, Lord, to comprehend and to remember, Lord, everything, God, that he shares with us tonight. And God, will thank you and praise you, Lord, for all things, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. And also, um, Sister Norma asked us to remember a family friend named Greg. Um, they've checked him for blood clots. If there are no blood clots, they're going to do two heart procedures on him tomorrow. Okay, let's pray for Greg right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we lift up, God, uh, another church member's friend, God, Sister Norma's friend, Jeff, God, that you would touch. Or, or was it Greg? Greg. Greg, Lord, you know who he is, God. Lord, I pray that you would touch Greg, God, right now. And, Lord, I pray that uh, you would just give the doctors, Lord, wisdom, God, to know what to do and how to treat him. And, uh, God, if they do have to do two heart uh, procedures, God, we pray uh, Lord, that you would guide the doctor's hands, Lord, as they do that procedure, Father, and Lord, that you would just touch God and move, Father God, in his life and give him a good and speedy recovery, and Lord, we'll thank you and praise you, God, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Help me sing tonight when we all get to heaven. tuning in. God bless you. And God bless pa uh, Pastor Cole. as he comes to share with us from the Word of God. Praise the Lord. Amen. So glad that you are with us this evening. Amen. Praise the Lord. And we are excited on what God is doing and what He's going to do. Thank you, Lord. Amen. It is a blessing to have you with us. I want you to buckle up tonight because we're going to try to cover Revelation 18 through 22 tonight. And um, just going to hit the highlights of it and some things that, that stand out to us. I'm going to be using some updated notes as well as some material from my own book that I've written. And um, I am in the process of my second book being published on spiritual warfare right now. And so we're grateful that God's allowed that to be completed and um, excited on what he is doing. Amen. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, let's go to Revelation chapter 18. We're going to cover Revelation 18 through 22 tonight, Lord willing. 
Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask God to anoint us. Father, in Jesus' name, we come to you right now. We ask God that you would touch us. Pray, God, that you would anoint us and pray, God, you'd strengthen us. Speak to our hearts, God. Give us insight, Lord, on these things, Lord. And, Father, just bless what we have prepared for tonight, God. And we just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're going to start with Revelation 18, verses 1 and 2. And the Word of God says the following. After these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power. And the earth was lighted with his glory. And he cried with a mighty and a strong, with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean, hateful bird. The other week when we studied this, we talked in Revelation 17 about the one world religious system, or the great whore of Babylon. And this week we're seeing in Revelation 18 the city Babylon being mentioned. And this whole chapter deals with the fall of Babylon and the kingdom of the Antichrist. Now what is interesting to note is that Babylon was the heart of the Babylonian Empire, the original Babylon, in Daniel chapter 2 when Nebuchadnezzar was king. He had this dream of the statue and the Babylonian Empire was the head of gold in that dream. Let's look at Daniel chapter 2 beginning with the 31st verse. It says, Thou, O king, sawest and behold a great image, the great image whose brightness was excellent stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. The image's head was of fine gold, his breast and arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till, a, till that a stone was cut without the hands which smote the image on his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. There Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken in pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away, and there was no place found, was found for them. And the stone was that smote that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So that was the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. Daniel recap that here. Then he interprets the dream, and listen what he says about Nebuchadnezzar. He says this. He says this. In verse 37, Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven have given thee kingdom and power and strength and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, that he, he hath the fowls of the heaven have given thee into thy hand and made them ruler of all. Thou art this head of gold. So Daniel's saying that the Babylonian kingdom of the Old Testament was the head of gold. We go on down and we understand that, that the other parts of the dream of the statue represented the other empires. All the way down to the feet of the iron and clay, we know the legs represented the Roman Empire. The feet of iron and clay represents the revived Roman Empire. But we also understand this. We also understand that according to the Old Testament, Babylon was going to be destroyed according to Isaiah 13 20 it says it shall never be inhabited neither shall it be dwelt from generation to generation neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there neither shall the shepherds make their fold there so we understand that Babylon was going to be destroyed and so, with that being said, I firmly feel Revelation 18, with that in mind, is, is a new Babylon. And there are several schools of thought to this. The first one is that it is Rome. 
for the first few centuries of the church, they held this view. Scholars like Tertullian and Irenaeus and Jerome all refer to Rome as Babylon. Given the view of the revived Roman Empire, particularly in dispensationalism of the 1900s, Babylon was also looked at as Rome with the European common market being the New World Order. We heard that a lot in the early 20th century and in, in the mid 20th century even. And then there was also the theory with that that the Roman Catholic Church was going to be, be the apostate religion and be the one world religion. However, in today's time, we understand that does not fit the description. Why? Because Babylon historically, and I believe presently, would be Aramaic in nature. Then there's the view that Jerusalem would be the new Babylon. The preterist view, which is the view that we talked about, which holds revelation historical and not literal, means they hold that Jerusalem is the new Babylon because Israel became a nation again in 1948. The problem with this view is that this theory does not hold true when it comes to the Bible and the end time discourses. Not once are people told to flee Jerusalem. Then there's the theory of New York City. Some modern translators try to put New York City as the new Babylon. And the reason why they do is because of the following reasons. They believe that Wall Street is the economic center of the world with the stock market. They believe because the United Nations are in New York City, that's the new world order. There you go. They believe that the Statue of Liberty is a symbol of it and that Catholicism is a major religion in New York City. But here is the reasons why this New York City is not the new Babylon. Number one, New York City is not where the, is not where the Antichrist is going to reign. We understand that the Antichrist comes out of the old Assyrian Empire, according to Isaiah and Micah. We understand that historical Babylon was a mis, mis, Middle Eastern city. And to conclude, these cities are not Aramaic in nature. We also understand that um, that Babylon, that Baal worship, is um, connected to Babylon and not Catholicism, and that the United States, as last we said the other week, is not mentioned specifically in Bible prophecy. So we, we get these things in mind and we understand that this new Babylon cannot be, um, cannot be Rome, it cannot be Jerusalem, it cannot be New York City. And then we get to verse 3 and it says the following. It says, For all nations have drunk the wine and the wrath of her fornication. The kings have committed, have, of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth wax rich through the abundance of her abundance of her delicacies. So we see we get we get there and we see that. The term fallen is used quite a bit in this text. The third verse here gives an account of the nations partaking with her, even though she is destroyed or is being destroyed. The symbolism here of holotry is used often in the canon, depicted corrupted religious practices. So we get here and we see that. And then we see in verse 4 the following. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out from of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. Post-tribbers use this verse to say this is where the rapture takes place. And so there are, as we understood, there are several different views to the rapture of the church. There's pre-tribulational, mid-tribulational, 
and post-tribulational. There's also something called pre-wrath, which holds that the rapture will take place before the last seven vials of God's wrath or bowls of God's wrath. And we also understand that, and we will look at this here later, that there's several different views of the millennium as well. So it can be confusing, but but I hope I hope this study has sorted some of this out for you. We look at verse five through eight, and it says the following in Revelation eighteen: For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she has rewarded you, and double, and unto her double according to her works in the cup where she hath filled to her double, how much she have glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she have saith in her heart, I sin a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plates come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. So we see in verses 5 through 8 the curse of her sin and the solution is the wrath of God. And then a series of songs of defeat comprise a song sung after this. In verses 9 through 10 we see the rulers of the world sing a song of mourning. In Revelation 18, 11 through 16, the merchants sing a song of mourning. And then the ship owners in Revelation 18, 17 through 20. So we see three groups here that are mentioned. First, the rulers who had given their power to the beast had committed immoral acts with her. As a reward for her subservience, the kings enjoyed her great luxury but when the city is destroyed, they will be terrified by her great torment and will stand at a distance. Then there are the merchants in verses 11 through 16. These weep and mourn because there is no one left to buy their goods. The collapse of the economy will mean the end of their trade and income. The third group to join is what is called the funeral dirge. These will be the ship owners and captains and the merchant ships and their crews who earn all their living from the sea. Now, here's something interesting to note. The original Babylon in the Old Testament, other than the Tigris and Euphrates River near it, was landlocked. The new Babylon here talks about merchants. They talk about ships and crews and captains. So that tells you that it is a port city. Given that the Antichrist is from the old Assyrian Empire and that the new Babylon is, in, is a port city, one could, one could make the assumption that it would be a city somewhere in the Middle East. Right now, we know of two prime candidates that it could be, number one, or even three. One, it could be um, possibly Damascus. Another one could be Mecca. Another one could be Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. All three of these cities right now are a candidate for this. Um, Dubai is very unique in that Dubai has just come out of nowhere in the last, in the last um, 30 years. It was just a desert. Right almost 30 years ago, but now it is one of the most prosperous cities in the Middle East. It is one of the most economic, st stability, stable cities, or stability, as my wife likes to use that term, stability, in the, middle, uh, in the Middle East. In fact, they even have a replica of the Hanging Gardens of Babylon in Dubai. If you will look it up online, you can you can search it out and see that they do. And there has been talk of moving the World Bank there. There's been talk of moving the United Nations there. Um, a lot a lot of, of politicians and stuff have investments there. And a lot of businessmen have investments there. And and also what is interesting to note is Dubai is the capital of the United Arab Emirates. 
which signed a peace treaty with Israel and restored their, their relationship ties just less than a year and a half or years ago uh, with our former president brokering that deal. What does this mean? Well, this means that one of these uh, Middle Eastern countries or cities or leaders, when the Ezekiel 38 war happens, is going to come on the scene and sign the peace treaty because it's going to have to take someone from that region to bring peace to that region or attempt to bring peace to that region. True, true. So that, that, that's just some unique things we need to look at there. So that's Revelation 18 in a nutshell. You get to Revelation 19, and you see in verse 1 that God is being declared. It says, And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. He's the only one that deserves our worship tonight. And this confirms worship with him. We see that self, that there's four hallelujahs given in this verse in this verse one, and also in verse two. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, have avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. So what, why are they giving the salvation, glory, honor, and power to God? It's because they're praising Him that His wrath, number one, is complete. And that number two, He has destroyed the harlot. And that number three, He's destroyed the false religious system. And the smoke rising set shows in the original language that this is a permanent, permanent destruction. And I want you to understand something, my friend. When God pours out His wrath, it's going to be His final wrath. Amen. We get to verses 7 through 10 in Revelation 19, and we see something very unique here. It says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to Him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His wife has made herself ready and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen clean and white for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints and he saith unto me right blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the lamb and he has said unto me these things are the true sayings of god and i fell at his feet to worship him and he said unto me see that thou, thou do it not I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. We see, first of all, here that the Savior is the bridegroom. We see that also the preparation of the bride takes place. And this is this reminds me of Matthew 25, 1 through 10, with the parable of the ten virgins. And the door is shut in that parable. It appears here the door is shut. Everything is finalized. Mm -hmm. John gets tempted here to worship the angel. However, the angel says for John not to do so. There's some debate here on if this was an actual angel or an angel that appeared in man-like appearance because he says, I'm thy fellow servant. But I'm here to tell you, my friend, I believe that whoever this is, John was tempted to worship him because he saw the glory of God. But this, this, this angel says here, don't do it. I'm just a fellow servant. I'm just a messenger. Worship God. Give honor to God. The whole gist of Revelation is about giving honor and praise to God. As a matter of fact, I will even say something further. The whole Bible is geared towards worshiping and giving praise to God as the written, inspired, God-breathed, Holy Ghost Word of God. Hallelujah. Yes. The identity of the church of the, as the bride completes this identity. 
We read in Romans 9, 25 and 26, the church is called a mystery. We read in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, the church is called a body. In Ephesians 2, 20 through 22, the church is called a building. But right here, the church is called the bride of Christ. Hallelujah. And I'm glad the bridegroom is coming. I'm glad Jesus is coming back. Hallelujah. One day a trumpet's going to sound. The dead in Christ is going to rise first. And then we which are alive and remain will be called up to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but that excites me tonight. In the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of all the craziness going on in this world, I'm glad I know my hope is building nothing less than Jesus' blood and His righteousness. On Jesus Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Hallelujah. Yes, yes. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Somebody give Him praise in the house this evening. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We get to verses 11 through 16, and we see the second coming of Jesus Christ. We see in verse 11 that he is riding on a white horse. You know, the first time he came, he rode on a donkey. Right. But the second time, he's riding on a white horse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We see in verse 12 that he had a name that no man knew but he himself. We see in verse 13 that Christ had a robe dipped in his own blood. This is linked to Isaiah 63, verses 2 through 4. Then we see in verse 14 that the armies of heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in linen, white and clean. Now let me say this. Would it make sense for him to, to rapture us up only to come back immediately? It don't make no sense. It don't make no sense. Would it, it wouldn't make sense for that. That's why I just lean more towards the pre-trib view of the rapture. Now, I don't, I'm, I'm not condemning my mid- and post-trib brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm not condemning my pre-wrath brothers and sisters in Christ or pre-tourists or literalists or whoever it is. But I'm here to tell you what I believe and what I feel is that the Lord's going to come back before everything gets so chaotic for His church. Mm -hmm. And seeing this bride illustration also reminded me of something else tonight. It reminds me of May 19, 2001 when I got married to my wife. I remember that day. It was a wonderful day. We'll be celebrating 20 years in May. Now, would it make sense that on wedding rehearsal night, I would go and beat her up? No. And beat the living daylights out of my wife. Would that make sense? No. I don't think the bridegroom, Jesus, would do that to his church either. So it just, it just makes sense to me. Enough of my soapbox. <laughs> Verse 15 tells us that he rules with a rod of iron. This fulfills Psalm 2, 9. And I'm going to go back to that. Psalm 2, 9. I'm going to read that. Amen. Psalm 2, 9 says, Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt jash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And then in verse 16, he is declared King of kings and Lord of lords. So we see that take place. And then in verses 17 through 21, the destruction is so great that it requires birds to clean up the battlefield. The scene is the completion of judgment and evil in this world. We see that, that this destruction is great because this is talking about the, the end of the battle of Armageddon, which is also mentioned in Revelation 14, 14 through 20, 16, 13 through 16, and 17, 14, as we talked about that. 
beginning in verse with verse 19, war is declared in Revelation 19, 19. It says, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. This war will end swiftly with the destruction of Antichrist and all the ungodly, according to 19 through 21. Let's look at verse 20. And the beast was taken with him, the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with, with, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that had worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the remnant that were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword perceived out his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. So the term lake of fire is only used in the book of Revelation. It is a place of punishment for the beast and the false prophet, according to verse 20. This is also Satan's destination, according to Revelation 20, verse 10. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, which is declared to be the second death in Revelation 20, verse 10. Whoever those names not written in the book of life will be cast into it along with the evildoers. The remnant is then slain. This confirms the following, that those who reject the truth will be destroyed and that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God and that they will be separated from the righteous after Christ returns in glory and will be assigned eternal punishment. We get to Revelation 20. And we see the millennial reign of Christ. In Revelation 21 through 3 we read, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. After that, he must be loosed for a little season. So an angel comes down from heaven with the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand and seizes upon the dragon and casts him into a pit for a thousand years that he should deceive the nations no more. The great enemy of God and, and his cause is thus made a prisoner and restraint from making war in any form against the church. The way thus is prepared for peace and the triumph which follows. We get to um, verses 4 through 6. And John sees thrones and persons sitting on them. We, we see that the millennium begins to fully take effect. In verses 7 through 8, Satan's released after a thousand years and get permitted to go out and deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth to gather them for battle. And a state of things will exist as if Satan were, was, were then released. And then in 9 through 10, we see the final doom of Satan. I used to have a shirt when I was in high school. I had a lot of scripture shirts after I got saved. I don't know where they're at now. Um... But one of them talk, said on the back, the next time the devil reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. Right. Yes. Verse 10 records his future. Mm -hmm. And the devil that deceived him was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, mm -hmm. where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Mm -hmm. So the next time the devil reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. Then in verses 11 through 15, we have something called the great white throne of judgment. And we read in verse 15, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. We get to Revelation 21, and there's a new heaven and a new earth. According to verse 1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the, former, for the first earth for was passed away and there was no more sea. John here sees a new heaven and a new earth. And then we understand that the new heaven and new earth is going to happen because of what Jesus says 
In Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Right. Hebrews 1, 10 through 12 says, Thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens and the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest. They shall wax old as doth a garment, and as a vesture thou shalt fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. Second Peter 3, 10 and 11, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, when the heavens shall pass away with great noise, and the elements shall melt with a forever heat. The earth also, and the works that therein, shall be burned up. Verse 4 records something wonderful. That gives hope. It says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Yes, yes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying. Neither shall there be more pain, for the former things are passed away. Right. No more tears, no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. Yes, praise the Lord. You know, we had a big adventure with Noah here this last month. Where we've been in the hospital twice. And there's times in the last little while where he's been crying off and on still sometimes. We don't know if it's the kidney stone. We don't know what it is. It may be an ear infection. Who knows? We're going to the doctor tomorrow. Hopefully we'll get an a little answer to that. But he can't tell us because he's special needs. But there's one day coming where he ain't going to be crying no more. Amen. Yesterday, I, yesterday, May 10 years, my mother's gone home to be with the Lord. She cried a lot in pain in the mornings those last few years. She had that brain aneurysm. And she was, she was just laying there those last couple of weeks. But she ain't laying there no more. Amen. She's whole. Amen. Praise the Lord. No more tears, no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. We get to verse 6, and as always, Jesus invites those who are spiritually thirsty to come to him and drink the living water. This water relates to the life-giving quality of the Holy Spirit through salvation and the baptism of the Holy Spirit and ongoing spiritual renewal and refreshment through companionship with God. But now the water is continually drunk. It's the key to being an overcomer. In verse 7, God himself declares who will inherit the blessings and benefits of the new heaven and new earth. It is those who, are faith, who faithfully persevere in their devotion to Christ and prove to be overcomers. Those who, who do not have a personal relationship with God to help them overcome sin and ungodliness will be thrown into the lake of fire, according to verse 8. And then we see some things in verses 8 through 26. Verse 8 shows that what will not be there. Circumstances and sin will not be there. Mm -hmm. Verse 9 shows that the bride, the wife of the Lamb will be there. Verse 12 discusses 12 gates. Verse 22, the Lord, the Lamb, are His temple. Verses 24 through 26, nations will walk there. And verse 25 says no night will be there. Mm -hmm. So we see these things. We get to Revelation 22. And Revelation 22 closes out the book of Revelation. I want to point out one thing from Revelation 22. Three times Jesus says, I come quickly. Verse 22, 7 says, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. We did see it again. In verse 12, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to his work should be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And then in verse 20, He which testified these things says, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Around these three I come quickly, we see a couple of things here. We see that verse 22 verse 6 says and he said unto me these things are faithful and true and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angels to show these things which must shortly be done now revelation as we know from the introduction was written sometime between 90 and 95 AD 
If, and notice here he says the things which must shortly be done. They were anticipating the Lord coming back in the New Testament. It's been, it's been several, it's been a couple thousand years now. And I'm looking for him to come back any time. Amen. And then we see in verse 10, and he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecies book, for the time is at hand. There it is again. You know, in the book of Daniel, Daniel's instructed in Daniel 12 to close up the book. But John's instructed to not seal up the book, to open the book, to tell people. And then verse 11 says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. So you see here, I believe John put this here for a reason. And that reason is, don't let people's negativity or don't let people's sinful lifestyle pull you away from the grace of God. And your walk with the Lord. Very true. And then we see here another neat thing in verse 17. It says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that hears say, Come. And let him that thirst come. And whosoever will let him come, take the water of life freely. He's saying here the, the commonality and the need for the power of the Holy Spirit. In the last days. Uh -huh. Revelation starts with he that hath an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Right. In Revelation 2 and 3. We get here at the end. And the Spirit and the bride say come. Uh -huh. And to me. If, 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 that's, if that's an urgency there. To let the Spirit speak. Then that means the Holy Spirit did not stop in the book of Acts. The power of the Holy Ghost did not stop after the first three centuries of Christianity. The power of God is just as real today as it was on the day of Pentecost. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Yes. And then Revelation ends with this. He which testified these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Even so come Lord Jesus. Yes. That should be our prayer. Even so come Lord Jesus. We may not get good doctor's reports in life. Even so come Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. Things may not be going great. Even so come Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. Just let God have his way. He's coming quickly. We need to be ready should that day come. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. And God, I pray you would keep us ready for your soon return. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us in this study on Revelation mm -hmm. over these last few months, God. And God, bless our next study, Lord, as you direct us to that, Father. And God, I pray, God, that your divine will be done in everything. We thank you, Lord, and praise you. In Jesus' name, we give you the praise. Amen. Thank you so much for coming tonight online and on the phone. Don't forget Sunday. We'll have Brother Paul will have the Sunday school video posted. And we'll be back here online Sunday morning at 11 a.m. and Sunday evening at 5 p.m. Pastors Council members, I will be calling you tomorrow evening around 5 till for our meeting. And so um, keep that in mind. Five till. Five till. Five till, till seven. Okay. Five, Five till, till seven. seven. Okay. So um, remember that 655, around thereabouts, you'll get a phone call from me. And we'll merge them and we'll, we'll talk together and pray together and talk about some things pertaining to the church. God's doing some great things. Thank you so much for watching tonight. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you. May he guide you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a blessed, wonderful evening.